Shalom Aleichem. We are going to discuss the question of Shalaf Geshamim. Namely, when we begin asking for rain in Eretz Israel and also in other countries, and what, on what date, at the beginning of the winter, do we begin asking for rain? So first of all, what is the standard practice that most people uh, follow nowadays? Most people nowadays follow the standard practice of saying Hazkarat um, Geshamim, we'll explain these two terms in a moment, Hazkarat Geshamim, starting on Shmini uh, Aseret, right in Musaf, last day of Sukkot, or the day after Sukkot really. But when it comes to Sheilaf Geshamim, asking for rain, as opposed to just mentioning that Hashem causes the rain to fall, they, they begin doing this on Zayn Bemar Heshwan, the seventh day of Heshwan, in Eretz Yisrael. And in Chutz Laaret, uh, the, the correct date is 60 days after Tukufat Tishrei, which is actually the 5th of December. It doesn't go by the Jewish date, it goes by the the non-Jewish date, actually. And that date now is the 5th of December. A hundred years ago it was the 4th of December, now it's the 5th of December. So first, just to keep everything in perspective, let us explain the terminologies. There is Hazkarat Geshamim and there is Sha'irat Geshamim. Hazkarat Geshamim means to mention the Hazkir, which by which we refer to what we say in the second barakha of Shmona Yisrael, where we say, Mashiv HaRuach HaMurid HaGeshem. That's called Hazkarat Geshemim. And that's mentioned in the first Mishnah, Masechet, in Masechet uh, Ta'aniyot. Does Kira means to mention, correct. The first Mishnah, Masechet Ta'aniyot, reads as follows. When do we begin to mention Givorot Geshamim? Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Miyom Tov Harishon Shahar, from the first day of Sukkot, we already begin to say Mashim Haruach Mila Geshem. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Miyom Tov Haharon Shahar, from the last day, the last Yom Tov, which is Shmini Aseret. That's the Mishnah, that's the, Mishnah the beginning of Ta'aniyot. There's also a Mishnah in Masechet Berachot. Hey, where it says Maskirim Givurot Geshamim with Hiat Hamithim, Ushela Bivirkat Hashanim. That we say Haskat Geshamim in the second bracha and Shelat Geshamim in the bracha known as Birkat Hashanim. It's very important to keep these two concepts clear and distinct in our minds Shelat Geshamim and Haskarat Geshamim because. When, when one does not uh, keep this distinction in mind, then everything becomes very foggy and unclear. It seems, in fact, that there was some confusion. It's very strange, but it's, so it seems from the Tamud Bavli, some of the discussions in the Tamud Bavli, the beginning of Masechet Ta'aniel, seem to indicate that there was such a confusion even, even in the Batem Midrash in, in uh, Bavel. In the Talmudic period, there also seems to have been some confusion on this point. So, with regards to Maskirim Gevorot Geshami, when we start to say Mashim Haruach Mila Geshem, there is in fact no Mahlokat. Everyone agrees that we start saying this on the, the second, in the second Racha of Shemini We begin to say this on Shemini Asereth from Musaf onwards. Alright, this is agreed to by all. The Halakha Lema'aseh, this is agreed to by all. That's the view of Rabbi Yoshua. And later, another Mishnah appears in the name of Rabbi Yehuda. And, and there's no discussion about this. With regards to Shainat Geshamim, here we have a whole, an entirely different uh, discussion. What are the options of when one can say Shainat Geshamim? In other words, from what day one begins or one should begin to say this? Regarding this, we have a Mishnah in the 
in Perek Aleph, also of Tanioth, Alachan Gimel, which states as follows. Mishalosha b'mal heshwan shalim et hageshamim. Mishnah states, and we we know for two reasons that this is the view of Rabbi Meir, even though it's a Stam Mishnah. We know this because, first of all, Stam Mishnah is usually Rabbi Meir, and second of all, it's quoted explicitly in the name of Rabbi Meir in the Yerushalmi. Mishalosha b'mal heshwan shalim et hageshamim. Rabban Gamliel Omer, b'shivabu, on the seventh of Malcheshwan. Hamisha asar yom, ahar hehar, kade shayagia, aharon, shabi Israel, in ahar paraf. Fifteen days, he explains why did I choose the seventh, why not the eighth, the sixth? Because that is, gives fifteen days for people to return from Yerushalayim who came on Aliyala Rechel, from the end of the Hag, to get back to the Har Parath in Bavel, which is where there was a large concentration of Jews, and this was considered a sufficient time to give all people, all the Oler Galim who came to Yerushalayim from Bavel, this gave them sufficient time to return to their homes and not be caught on, on the way on, 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 uh, in, by, by rain, by storms, which would bog them down in the, in the mud and, and cause them great hardship, etc., getting home. So there's no question that Rabban Gamliel is telling us that the reason I chose this date, Shirav Mar Heshwan, is not because uh, that's the the uh, that's the weather pattern in Eretz Yisrael, or that is the uh, agricultural requirement, or, or that's what we need here in Eretz Yisrael. In fact, he's implying quite clearly we would begin earlier, were it not for the fact that we don't want to pray for rain and have our prayers answered when our Brethren are returning to Bavel on uh, on their camels and their donkeys and their caravans, etc. And it's it's a fair, fairly long journey. And if the, if it rains, it makes things very difficult indeed. It could even perhaps lead to, to situations of uh, of sakanaf and fashoth being bogged down, maybe not having food, all sorts of things of this nature. So we wait till the seventh of Mahashwan. So that it's clear that what the the uh, rationale behind the view of R- Rabban Gamliel is. As for the first opinion, which we explained is Rabbi Meir, which says Bishloshal Mar Heshwan, which is only four days earlier, one might think that uh, here it's uh, not not the same rationale. Here it's simply the right date to begin the third of Mar Heshwan. Why? Because that's when uh, it's reasonable to begin the rain to fall, shall we say? In Eretz Yisrael. But we see from the sugya that we're about to look at in the Talmud Bavli and the Talmud Yerushalmi, we see this is not the case. Now, what I'm going to do now is just give it to you briefly, uh, and then we'll look at some of the sources inside. What we see in the sugya is that both Rabbi Meir, who was a Tanakana in our Mishnah, and Rabbi Gamliel, they both hold that what we're saying, whether it's Gimel or Zayn al is because of Oled Galim. It has to do with the fact that there are people who are returning home. And that's why we hold off from saying Shilat Gishamim before this date. I'll read to you the Perush of the Ritba, for example. He says, Perush ben Lathana Kama. This is the Ritba on the Mishnah in uh, Ta'anyoth, Daf Yod Amud Aleph. Perush ben Lathana Kama, ben Laraban Gamliel, Mishnathen Obezman Shabet Hamidash Kayam. They both are discussing a time when the Beit Mikdash is standing, and therefore you have Oler Galim, people coming to Yerushalayim for the Chag. This Mishnah is Bizman Shabbat Hamidash Kayam Hi Shinuya. Ulechule Alma Zman Geshamim Hu Lahare Hav. In other words, everyone admits that Zman Geshamim is already considered the proper Zman to ask for rain immediately after Sukkot. In other words, from Arvith of Mosei Shmini Asereth. Right, the very the first tefillah hold that you would say after the Chag, which would be Arvith of Shmini Aseret of Mosei Shmini Aseret, would already be a proper time to ask start asking for Geshem. I'm talking about Sherat Geshemim, right? Mas Mas Kirim Geshemim we we mentioned before, which is to say Mashim Baruch Mila Geshem. Everyone agrees you you really begin saying from Musaf of Shmini Aseret during the day. We're talking now about when you add 
in shenaf in birkat hashanim when you add she'ela, which according to the nusach of Eretz Yisrael you say uvarech shenafenu birchishmer asan beracha onu dava and according to the bavri nusach you say within talum matalik beracha etc. When do you begin to say that? So the Ritba says both Rabbi Gamliel who says zayin and the Tanakhama who is Rabbi Meir who says gimel b'macheshwan they both agree that really we should be starting to do this immediately after the Chag. אלא דבזמן שבית המקדש קיים חיישן על עול הרגלים שלא יעשרם הגשם בהחזרתם ונמצאת מכשילם לעתיד לבוא if they would be bogged down by a terrible weather on the way back they may not want to come next time to Mishalayim for, for, for the Chag because of the terrible experience of getting back that's what he means when he says ונמצאת מכשילם לעתיד לבוא ורבן גמליאל חייש לכולו עול הרגלים ואפילו לאחרון שבהם the difference, therefore, between the Tanakhama and Rabban Gamliel is that Rabban Gamliel says, I'll give them another four days so that even the, the last, the slower travels, the last of them will get home before we start asking for rain. Whereas Rabban Gamliel, Rabbi Meir, the Tanakhama, says, Gimel Gamliel, he says the vast majority, 95% have already got home. And for the last 5%, we're not going to wait, because we also have our, our issues over here. We need rain. And, and it's a very practical issue. It's a very real issue. People sow their, their fields in Eretz Yisrael with wheat, um, depending on the part of the country. Sometimes already in Tishrei, and there was a, uh, sometimes already um, the beginning of Tishrei, or middle, uh, before Rosh Hashanah, uh, sometimes even before Rosh Hashanah in some places. But usually, at that time, the end of, the end of uh, Tishrei, it will be the time around Rosh Chodesh Mar Hashwa will be the time for, for sowing the fields. And if the seeds sit in the earth for too long without any rain, they'll just rot and nothing will, nothing will come of them. And then they'll have to sow again. So we want and we very much need it to rain within a relatively short period after the sowing of, of the seeds in the ground. So Rabbi Meir, who says, Gimel Mar Hashwa says, we waited for 95% of them, that's enough. We did, we did the best we can do for them. And Ran Gamil says we can wait another four days. That's the difference. Now, they're both near to Israel. Neither of them are Bavim. They're both near to Israel. But they're taking into, into account the fact that there are many large numbers of Olor Galim every year, every Chad, coming to Jerusalem. What becomes apparent from the discussion of the Gemara in... Uh, both in the Talmud of the and in the Talmud of Shani, is that is that this Mishnah this Mishnah is referring to a time as as the Rebbe just explained to us when the Beit Midrash stands and there is there is a Midrash and therefore there are all all the Chalim. Now, when there are no Ole uh, Rechadim, then the, uh, the picture changes. Where do we find this? If we look on, on Daf Yod, Amul Aleph, in the Talmud Bavli, where, where this Mishnah appears, in Tan Yod, then all we are told on this Mishnah that we just read is that Amar Abi Al-Azhar, is also another Gisa, which is Amar Al-Hista, Halakha Karabban Gamliel. So the halakha is that you wait till Zayn al Hashwan. And that's it. That's all it says, really. Oh, that's more, more or less what's relevant to our discussion. There is another statement which is somewhat relevant, and, and that is the statement of Hananiah, who was a Tana who went to Bavel, and uh, he made certain takanoth and, and instructed the Jews in Bavel. This is a fairly early period still, how to conduct themselves in the Gola, in, the, in Bavel. He said, the situation in Bavel is different, the agricultural cycle is different, the weather patterns are different, and in fact it's not helpful at all for them to have rain before, uh, for, for a lot, it's, it's, it's better not to have rain for a lot, much longer period. So the, he said, Uvagola ad shishim batkufa, that's the date we mentioned, the 5th of December. And this is the halakha in Bavel. It's a separate discussion, uh, interesting discussion in itself. Uh, what should be done in uh, in other countries outside Eretz Yisrael, which are not Bavel, which are not similar to Bavel in their in their agricultural and, and weather patterns and, and requirements? 
whether you should be following the Shiva Marcheshwan or Shishemion Batkufa, which is the 5th of December. And here we find different opinions amongst the Mishonim. Some say that we follow the, the practice of Bavel, we, we, we say uh, we wait till Shishemion Batkufa, which is the 5th of December. And others say that's that's only for Bavel, where that was that was their, that fitted their requirements and their their situation. Our situation is different, and and therefore we should start start uh, asking for anybody b'zayim marcheshwan. So says the Rosh Lemashal. He says the Rosh asks on this uh, on this uh, very sugya. He says I, I don't understand why most people in most places ask start asking for rain only b'zayim marcheshwan, only shishim yom batkufa, the fifth of December. Well, in fact, we live in, a, in, a, in an area where, where rain is definitely required earlier. So says the Rosh, and this is in Siman uh, Dalid, Perekal of Siman Dalid, and he says, Why do we behave as if we're in Bavel? We're not in Bavel, and our require, requirements are different. So I just, I don't read, I'm not going to read every word, I, I just get to the, to the punchline. He says, it's well known here in Europe, all right, where he lived. That the fields that were sown, if there was not to rain till, until that day, until the 5th of December, that the, all, the, all the seeds that were sown in the fields would, would be lost. Therefore, we should act in according, in according to the Mishnah. And he says, and when I, was, when I once traveled, he says, Provence and Provence, the south of France, the Russians from, from Ashkenaz, from Germany. I saw that they mean Haggis, in fact, to do it. And this, was very, this is very correct in my opinion. So says the Rosh. As opposed to... Uh, as opposed to some other Rishonim, as I said, who suggested that no, we should, we, we follow the, the practice of Bavel in, in all in all things, the, in all matters. The Meiri also, uh, who, who was from Provence, uh, relates to this issue, and he he brings three opinions about when people in Chutzlar should ask for start asking Shedat Gishamim. He says, "Yes, Mekomot Shenagu Shaloli Shol Ad Shishim Batkufa." And he says exactly why. Which is a very straightforward statement and also an admission. In other words, it's not just in this regard either. It's, it's a general statement, which, even though he maybe doesn't mean in a general sense, but it's a general statement which, which is true for many things. That many of the practices of Jews and Chutzlaritz over a long, very long period of time were actually simply a continuation of being Hageb Bavel. Even though they didn't always fit the reality in France or in Spain or in North Africa or wherever it may have been, that's one opinion. In other words, we only follow them in the Bavel when they also fit where we live. But we live in a different place, and our requirements are different, and therefore uh, we should ask on Zayim Marcheshwan. And he says, This is the practice in all our. Where we in our area in Provence, which is exactly what the Rosh was telling us. The third opinion, he says, is immediately In other words, the end of Shmini Aseret. So we have these three three possibilities. The third possibility is that the first was Shishim Yom Batkufa, the fifth of December, which is only only reasonable, only makes sense for certain places like such as Bavel, but most countries not like Bavel. The other opinion, the second opinion was Zayim Hishwan, and the third opinion was immediately on the night following Shmini Asirith. The point that we're trying to make here tonight is to prove and to demonstrate that this third opinion is, is, is without a doubt the correct opinion. Why do I say it's without a doubt the correct opinion? The fact of the matter is that both Talmudim actually say so. It's a very strange, it's a very strange thing indeed, really, when you think about it. 
to find a, a situation where both Talmudim actually make some, a statement quite uh, unambiguous and, and uh, clear-cut statement, and yet uh, you find that many halachic practices don't fit what, what the both Talmudim are telling you. In the Talmud Bavli, we find this discussion. Uh, this, this matter is discussed not so much on, on the Mishnah, on Daf Yod, but actually previously on Daf Tal Beth. Why is it discussed, discussed on Daf Tal Beth? Because the, uh, the Gemara raises the issue that we seem to have a, a problem with the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. Why? Because on the one hand, Rabbi Yehuda says, it's, it's a quote in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, that we start, that we, the switch over, when it comes to Hazkara, is always on on in Tfilat Musaf, and with regards to Sukkot, it's the last day of Sukkot, or Shmei Aseret, and with regards, with regards to Pesach, it's the first day of Pesach. So we begin saying Mashiva Rahm on, on on Musaf of Shmini Aseret, and we cease saying that, and switch to the Nusach uh, Aret, he says Mashiva Rahm Hatal, or just Murid Hatal. Or, or just not saying anything at all, which is also a possibility, because there's no requirement, there's no chovat to say Murid Hatam, as there is to say Moshe Baruch Hu Geshem. To see saying Lazkir Geshem uh, from the first day of, of Pesach, which is, which is perfectly all right. The trouble is that Rabbi Yudha is also quoted as saying that you continue to ask for Geshem in the tefillah, or shall we say, during Chol Amor'ed Pesach. Not the first day, but during Chol Amor'ed Pesach, when you have regular tefillah, when you say, we have in Vorech Hashanim, that you also say, you ask for rain, all the way till the end of Pesach, to the last day of Pesach. So in other words, we have a, a rather uh, anachronistic situation. Uh, it's not very logical that you, you're asking for rain, but you're not mentioning rain. In other words, you don't. Maskirim Geshamim, Haskarat Geshamim always comes as a preface to and as, as, as something that goes together with Sherat Geshamim. But to have Sherat Geshamim without Haskarat Geshamim doesn't make sense. That's what the Talmud asks. Both Talmudim ask this question. Rabbi Yohanan uh, explains. He, he gives a he gives a psak halacha when he's asked this question. He's quite quoted here in the Talmud Bavli as saying, Rabbi Yohanan said as follows: Hithil lahaskir, matchil lishol. As soon as you begin to mazkir to say Mashiv Rachmi la Geshem, matchil lishol. You immediately begin also to say Shenat Geshamim and Bikat Hashanim. Pasak mi lishol, pasak mi lahaskir. As soon as you cease. Uh, one, you see, see, they, they go together. What Rabbi Yohanan says, they always go together. When you maskir, you shu'el. When you shu'el, you maskir. So then how do we explain the fact that Rabbi, that Rabbi Yudha is quoted on the one hand as saying that you cease Haskara on the first day, but you continue shu'el after the last day? So the only way to explain that is, in both Talmudim, again, the, the answer is given, that apparently there are two traditions or two statements in the name of Rabbi Yehuda or that one of them is not really the view of Rabbi Yehuda, it's Rabbi Yehuda ben Bethera, and well, that's how I was confused with Rabbi Yehuda, it's a different, different Tana. At any rate, that, that can be explained one way or the other, but Rabbi Yohanan's Psaq Alakha, unequivocal Psaq Alakha was, Mathil Azkir, Hithil Azkir, Mathil Ish'ol, Pasak Mil Ish'ol, Pasak Mil Azkir. That's what Rabbi Yohanan said, that's in the Talmud Bavli. Then the Talmud Bavli asks, uh, "Wait a second! Don't we have, don't we have, uh, don't we have a Mishnah which tells us that the times for asking Shirat Kishamim are either Shloshav Mar Cheshwan or Zayim Mar Cheshwan?" And you, Rabbi Yochanan, are telling us that as soon as you say Askarat Kishamim, you also begin Shirat Kishamim, which means well before Gimel Mar Cheshwan. In other words, already Musa E. Shmini uh, Aseret, which is Leil Kaf Gimel B'Tishrei, correct? So it's well before Gimel Ma'cheshwan and Kal Wachomer well before Zayn Ma'cheshwan. So the, the maskana of the sugya is La Kashya, Kam Bezman Shebet HaMidash Kayam, Kam Bezman Shein Bet HaMidash Kayam. In other words, this is what, what the Ritbar explained to us before. 
that the Mishnah, which spoke about Shlosha Abba Cheshwan or Shiva Abba Cheshwan, was talking about a time when the Beit Midrash stands and there are Ole Ruchalim. Then we wait because of the Ole Ruchalim. We delay asking for rain, even though normally we would, we would want to do so, but we don't because of the Ole Ruchalim. In that situation, in fact, there is a different a distinction between Zman Haskara and Zman Shaila. You begin Haskara. Haskarat Gishamim on Shmini Aseret with Musaf, but you wait to, to say Shedat Gishamim till either Gimel Mar Heshwan or Zayim Mar Heshwan because of Ole Regalim. But when there's no Ole Regalim, then the Halakha is as Rabbi Yohanan told us because he was talking really about a period after the Khurban. Rabbi Yohanan said, if you, if you, uh, you say Haskarat Gishamim, you also say Shedat Gishamim. It goes together. Both at the beginning and at the end. And if you end, you, you see saying Haskarat Kishamim the first day of Pesach, so you also see saying Shalat Kishamim the first day of Pesach. This is what the Talmud says in, uh, in the Talmud Bavri Daf Daradamud Beth. The same sugya, or similar, very similar sugya, appears also in the Talmud uh, Yerushalmi in Taniyot Perikalaf Halachabef. The question was asked regarding uh, asked of Rabbi Yohanan. It says here in the Talmud uh, a, a similar question. What about this problem of Rabbi Yehuda that we find him saying two, apparently not quite the same thing in two different places? And he said to them, "I'm telling you what the halacha is. Halacha." Makom shemaskirim shoalim. When you say haskara, you also do sheila. So as soon as you say mashivur rachmid ageshem, you also begin to say sheilat kishamim. Then there's a discussion, interesting discussion that is brought here in the in the Talmud Yerushalmi, and the maskana. I'm not going without reading the whole thing now. The maskana again is as follows. First of all, we see during this discussion that, that uh, more than one Amora, apart from Rabbi Yohanan, held the same view as Rabbi Yohanan. In other words, all the Amora in Eretz Yisrael, post Khurban, are all of the same opinion. Namely, that Makom Shemaskirim Shoalim. The question was asked, for example, of Rabbi uh, Zeura, Initially, he said he wasn't sure, but eventually he, it says in the Yerushalmi, "Besofa it masayithle," which means he, he he was convinced and, and and he found the right answer and he was sure of this and he said, "This is the halacha." He said, "La shanya." No, the truth is we don't make a distinction. In other words, we we start and saying both at the same time. Halacha makom shemaskirim shalim. He goes on to say. The same thing, the same statement was made by Rabbi Hiya Bar Ba, also in the name of Rabbi Yohanan. Makom Shemazkirim Shalim. And it says further, Rabbi Aha Darash Beth Midrasha. This is also was taught by Rabbi Aha in his Beth Midrash, and also by Rabbi Yirmiya Darash Bechnishat Adabule in the Beth Knesset of uh, of the Mu'iseth Ha'ir, in other words, the city council. They had a shul of their own, and he gave a drasha in which he gave this, he announced this halakha to the public. He said, halakha makum shemaskirim shu'alim. So everyone agrees this is the case. All we need to do now is explain. So what about the Mishnah? Why is the Mishnah say b'shloshah b'mar cheshwan? Or b'shivah b'mar cheshwan? About this, the Yerushalmi says, amar rabbi tanhum bar hiya b'sha'at ha-mikdash shanu. That is how it should read. It says shane. But it should, so it should say Shanu, apparently. And what it means is very simple. This Mishnah refers to, to the time when the Midash stands. And not when the Midash is, 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 does not exist, and therefore no or no or the Kali. So, we find in both Talmudim clear statements to the effect that whatever the Mishnah was speaking about, when it, when it, whenever the Mishnah said that you ask for Geshem, Shirat Geshemim begins in Marcheshwan, it was talking about a time when there are Ole Regalim, and when there is no Mikdash, and therefore no Ole Regalim, 
you, you begin saying Shirat uh, Kishamim in Eretz Yisrael, at least, where it's not harmful. It's, it's actually very, it's required, it's necessary, it's good, it's beneficial. You ask for rain immediately, Shmini Aseret. In Chutzlar, it's in certain places, at least like in Bavel, for example, where it's harmful for them to have rainfall at that time, and they, and they Dafka wants it to happen later. There they, uh, in, in, uh, in, in response to this different reality, they, they say Shirat Gisham in a different time. So the question about other countries, uh, is, as the Rosh said, that we have to go according to our reality. So in fact, the Rosh, one could only uh, remark about the Rosh that uh, it would even is possibly true. I don't know exactly what the agricultural cycle was in Germany or in Spain in the time of the Rosh, but it's possible that one could even uh, posit that they may have, they should have been saying Shirat Gishamim already immediately and would say Yom Tov and not not wait till Zayim Ma'achashwan. The Rosh was saying we should say Zayim Ma'achashwan, not wait till Shishim Yom Matkufal, which is which is a long time later, the fifth of December. It's a difference of uh, of a uh, month and, uh, and a half or something. Now it's true that not all Rishonim uh, are of this opinion, but we have sufficient Rishonim who tell us that, uh, that this is uh, this is a maskana of, of the Talmud. We saw that the Meiri brings three opinions; it doesn't actually uh, express a firm opinion. We see that the Rita Ba after the same place where I read to you before, I quoted to you before, in the Mitra Bar, in his Chidushim on Darfi Yodam Al-Alif, he says, he says that the Talmud explains to us, by the Sugiyah we discussed on Darf Talad, Lema de la'olam travayu lahara hurban, vahalan vahalaho. The Talmud explained over there that in Bavel where they have, where they're still gathering in the crops during the end, the end of Tishrei and, and, and Racheshwan, etc., till Shishim Yom Batskufa, it's not good for them to have rain, and therefore they go like Hananiah, as we explained. But the Meiri goes, the Ritva goes on to explain, he says, Misha HaGeshamim, Tovim Lahim, in those places where rain is, is positive and required and, and wanted, desired, Immediately after the Chag, because we don't want it during Sukkoth, we don't want it to rain during Sukkoth, right? So we're not going to ask for rain in the middle of Sukkoth. That's the view of Rabbi, uh, that's the view of all, all the uh, Tanaim. Rabbi Eliezer said we must kill Geshamim from the beginning of Sukkoth, but not that we ask for Geshem. But Rabbi Yoshua said we even must kill only at the end, the last day. So, the Ritba sums up, he, he gives a Psach Halacha, he says, Misha Geshamim Tovim Lahim, immediately and they haven't got their crops still being gathered in and there's not uh, wheat and other produce lying in the field that would be uh, caused to rot or be otherwise ruined by rain not like in Bavel, in other words That's the, so the Ritiba is of this view also that in Eretz Israel or other countries where rain is desirable and beneficial immediately after the Chag, when there's, and there no, there's, no, there's no issue of Oler Ghalim and there's no issue of crops that may be ruined, then you begin asking for these things immediately after the Chag. In other words, you ask for rain immediately after the Chag in Birkat Hashanim. Another Rishon who also states this explicitly is the uh, Riaz. The Yaz Rabbeinu Eliyahu Rabbeinu Yishayahu Aharon, I'm sorry, Rabbeinu Yishayahu Aharon This is the uh, grandson of the Reed and he writes 
He writes as follows. This is in... In Perek Aleph, in Piskei Ari'az, Halacha, Halacha, wow, he says as follows. First of all, he explains that we we ask for Geshem. We, we, we mention Geshem as Kirim Geshemim already the last day of, of the Chag. But we ask for rain depending on when it's required. So he says, Kesad, Be'eretz Yisrael bezman shebet ha-Migdash kayam. In Eretz Yisrael the Migdash is kayam and there are all Eregalim. Then we wait till Shiva and Ha-Heshwan. That's the view of Angamiyad at least. The fact is in Yerushalmi it always follows the Stam Mishnah. So, according to Yerushalmi, when there is a Beit Hamikdash, it will begin on Shlosh Avraham Cheshvan. Uvezman she'en Beit Hamikdash kayam she'en olen regalim me'ed she maskirim morid hageshem bevirkat tehiyat hamitim shoanim v'tein talum matab bevirkat hashanim ahar yom tov aharon miyad keshmit parim tefilat chol. All right, that's what the Rid says. That in in Eretz Yisrael, when there's no Mikdash, you, you begin immediately after the Chag. And this is also, by the way, the view of the Ran. The Ran on the on the reef in Masechet Tanit is always of the same opinion. So we have several Shonin. We have the Riaz. We have the Ran. We have the Miri who brings this brings this position. We have the Ritba. So we have four major Shonim at least who tell us that this is the correct thing to do. Which, of course, brings us to the question: Why why is this not being done by most most people today? One answer, of course, would be to say that, that, that they're following uh, those other posakim who were of the opinion that uh, such as the Rambam, who indicates that you ask always B'zayim and Ar-Heshwan. It's also apparently what we see from the Reef. This is what you find in the Shohan Aruch, etc. So, the technical answer is that people are following another, another shita. But the fact is that the ta- both Talmudim, Talmud Bavli and Talmud Yerushalmi, make it very clear that uh, when there's no Mikdash, that's not, that's not how it's supposed to work, not, not supposed to work in that fashion. I think, therefore, the real answer is that we're, we're talking here about uh, the same kind of phenomenon that that causes all, all kinds of strange uh, practices uh, amongst amongst the Jewish people nowadays, just as uh, following following a, a, a psak or, or a minhag that does not fit the reality it doesn't seem to bother people in, in many other contexts such as the, the, the issue we've mentioned on many occasions, the Ashkenazi minhag of, uh, of saying Yikum Purkan on Shabbat, uh, bl- blessing the Geonim and uh, what have you in Bavel who haven't existed for a thousand years. Uh, and this doesn't seem to bother most people. I was told recently by someone that, well, it's not really a big, big issue because in our shul, uh, the Shleav Tzibur just says it mumbles it quietly and no one actually hears what he's saying. <laughs> All right, well... <laughs> Well, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it, but uh, that, that the fact is not, that this doesn't change the fact that it's in the Siddur and, and it's being said. Whether it's being mumbled or being said clearly, whether people are actually noticing what's being said or they're busy talking to their neighbor, I don't know, uh, but that doesn't change the fact. It doesn't make sense. It all equally doesn't make sense to wait till Zayim Mar Heshwan to ask for rain when we all know that we need rain, not today, I mean, yesterday. If it wasn't for the fact that it's going to be Sukkot soon, we'd be asking for rain already now. In fact, this year now, as we all know, in Eretz Yisrael, it's begun, there's really been some rain earlier than, uh, at least according to the Jewish calendars, earlier than you might, might expect, according to the the Gregorian calendar is not so, not so unusual because it's already uh, the end of September, the beginning of October, there can be some rain sometimes, and that's what's happened this year. Rain, at any rate, is def- very much needed, and there's absolutely no reason to put it off. So, th- the practice of waiting till Zayn al is is anachronistic, and it's, it, it flies in the face of what both Talmudim are telling us. 
and many Rishonim stress this point. It's true that not all the Rishonim say this, but even though the Rambam is not one of those who says it, but the Rambam does tell us in his Hakdama, as, we've, as we've also mentioned before, that when you are faced with more than one opinion uh, amongst the Geonim or the Rishonim, you follow the opinion that that logic and, 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 and uh, proofs from the tongue would indicate is the correct view. This is clearly the correct view. If it says plainly, in no uncertain terms, that Rabbi Hanan was posek halacha, then who, who can come along and disagree with Rabbi Hanan? Does anyone claim that they have the authority to disagree with Rabbi Hanan? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit the, the reality, it doesn't fit the facts, it doesn't fit... Uh, um, normative halachic behavior when you have such a clear instruction in, in, in the both Talmudim what to do to do something different doesn't make any sense the only way to, to view it I think therefore is to, is to recognize that we we see before us an example of where, where halachic practice is somehow out of step with, with reality, or at least many people's halachic practice I, I think it's clear that one may and should ask for a ready mutzay Hag and what's one doesn't have to wait for anything, and um, and I have no doubt that's the correct psak and, the, and there's no doubt this is what was done in Israel after the Churban, and there's no doubt that Talmud uh, even the Talmud Bavli admits and, and says as much. And we have many wish on him to to rely on, on for this for this psak What bothers me more, however, I must tell you, is not, is not so much the fact. Not only the fact that the, the psak halacha that people are following is 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 not rational or logical, or not following the uh, the uh, not not in keeping with the, with the requirements and, and needs of, of of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael today, but the fact that it doesn't seem to bother anyone that it's not not <laughs> in 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 line and, and and keeping pace with reality. That's what that to me is is the bigger issue. The 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 fact that people some people, of course, don't know that this whole issue exists. They just do, like Shimon Yudas says, they just do what it says in the Sidur, what, what, what the Gabai, you know, when he, when he claps the Bama or the stender and he says, you know, ten talamotar, he knows he's supposed to start, so that's what he does. So some people just don't know, that's okay, but some people do know. Certainly Tamadei Chachamim supposedly know. So people have read these Sugiyot and read these Bishonim, and of course, I think there are many such people who have read it and know it, and yet they continue doing something which doesn't square with what they learned. In other words, this, this uh, cognitive dissonance between what one understands to be correct and what one sees in the sources as, as, as being being said and stated clearly as being correct and what sits well in one's, in one's mind, in one's heart, this is the right thing to do on the one hand, being able to recognize that on the one hand, I'm sure many people recognize that, many people who have learned these so good are aware of it, and then on the other hand to get up and somehow um, wipe your mind clean of anything that you may have learned or somehow manage to ignore it completely and act differently in a manner which you yourself can't even rationalize to yourself, can't explain except for the for the statement, well that's what it says in the Mishnah Burra, well, that's what it says in this book, or uh, well, this is what so and so, Rabbi so and so said, shall we say. I think this is the, 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 uh, the real problem. The real problem is is the, the fact that it does not seem it doesn't seem to be requ- a requirement in, in the eyes of many people that halacha makes sense. But halacha does have to make sense. Someone said to me just the other day that I was discussing a certain halachic issue with this person, and, and this person I was trying to explain why a certain thing is as it is, and he said, "I don't know. I don't want to know why it is. I just want to know what I'm supposed to do." So, I, and I said to him, "Well, you have to understand. If you want to know what to do, you have to understand why it is. Otherwise, you won't, you won't be doing the right. You may not be doing the right thing." This is this is the danger that some of the Rishonim really pointed out. Which, is, which exists. There is a certain danger in, in studying a book like the Rambam without knowing other sources because one can uh, read something the Rambam says sometimes. Not always the case, but it can happen. One can read something the Rambam says and, and think it applies to your situation, but in fact it doesn't because you don't understand or didn't follow either the Rambam didn't fully explain because he's being brief 
or you misunderstood the Rambam said, or you just don't have the, the knowledge to understand the rationale behind it, and therefore know that what the Rambam said here doesn't apply, or something he says, the next halakha is what applies to your situation, etc. At any rate, when one approaches any halakhic uh, discussion in the correct manner, that is to say, one learns it from the primary sources, from the Mishnah, and the Tosefta, and the, the Talmudim, etc., it becomes very clear that this is the the the, uh, the correct psak halacha in Eretz Yisrael today is lishol geshamim miyad mosei shmini aseret miyad mosei chag. In Chutz Laaretz, it's a question of 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 the country in which one lives. I think most countries in Chutz Laaretz are not like Bavel. Bavel had its own unique, peculiar. Uh, weather patterns and agricultural cycles, but that's not true of the United States. It's not true of France. It's not true of New Zealand. It's, it's simply not not true at all. They're not like Bavel in any way. So the shishim yom betkufa to wait to ask for rain till the fifth of December, as the Rosh points out, he says it makes no sense whatsoever. The Rosh, by the way, also said the opposite in the opposite direction. The Rosh said that in Eretz Israel, it's not required and not beneficial to have rain after Pesach. So that's why we stop asking for rain on Pesach. But in but in certain parts of Chutzah, such as Spain, he writes, it's actually very necessary to have rain all the way till Shavuot. So here, he says in Spain, where he lived the latter part of his life, he says we should be asking for rain till, till Shavuot, not stop at Pesach, because the, the Mishnah, which said, you cease asking for rain, Shilat Kishamim ends during Pesach, is because it was relating to the realities and the needs of, of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael, but not what goes on in Spain. So it all depends on where you are, where you live. And there are many Pesachim who hold this view, but again, the general practice is not that way. The general practice is to do something which doesn't make any sense. Now, to take another example, just to illustrate how illogical things can become, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, where the, where the seasons are reversed, in most in fact, I think all parts of the Southern Hemisphere, what people are told to do, which I think is clearly wrong, uh, according to a very long list of Posakim that one could mention, the Rosh and the Rambam and the Tor, and, and, and the list is very, very long indeed. People are told to say, Shalat Geshamim, not according to where they live and according to the needs of their place, shall we say in Australia, where, where they, in, the, in, the, in the middle of of uh, the winter when they need rain, they're not asking for rain, they ask, they ask for rain uh, at a time when Eretz Israel requires rain, but not when they need rain. Again, this is, has to do with a, a reluctance on the part of um, certain Rabbanim who were asked. I don't think people weren't asked. Certain Rabbanim were asked when Jews first arrived in Australia 200 plus years, well, something like 200 years ago, anyway. Um, what, should, what should they do? And they were told, just continue as you always did before, which is an easy answer to give because it doesn't require very much courage or thought, but, but it's not the right answer. The right answer is that you, you do according to the seasons and the patterns that, are, that exist over there. Obviously, in the Southern Hemisphere, the whole thing is reversed. So, you, so in the, the winter, the summer of, of, uh, of Eretz Yisrael is the winter over there, and they should be asking for rain in their winter, not, and not, not, not in Eretz Israel's winter. Because the, the, you're asking for panasa for yourself, for, for the country in which you live, because that's where you are right now. And you, this is a requirement. Not that you don't care about Eretz Israel, but, but you have to, have to survive tomorrow. And, uh, and, and, and Jews in Eretz Israel will ask for what they require, just as the Jews of Bavel didn't ask for rain for Eretz Israel even because when they lived in Bavel it was going to harm them. If it was going to harm them in Bavel, they didn't ask for rain. They asked for rain in Bavel when they, when they needed rain. So I think there's a, a, two, two issues here, which are really two sides of the same coin. One is yiratha hura'a, in other words, a fear of giving uh, a courageous, even though I, don't think, I actually see the great courage required, but some people apparently think it's courageous. The, the, the an, an inability or an unwillingness to give a courageous and correct psakalacha for a, a new situation, and therefore simply by default continuing to do what you've done before, which is true of, of many, many issues. And these, these are just examples of that. And the fact that there seems to be a tremendous lack of intellectual honesty in this whole approach, that you can do things which which cannot be rationalized, which do not make sense,
which fly in the fa face of reason and, and, and your own requirements, in fact. But it somehow doesn't make a difference because halakha ceases, apparently in, in, in some people's minds, in some people's eyes, halakha has ceased to have any real meaning and doesn't have to be connected to reality. It's just something that you do, some, it's some kind of a folklore. It's Jewish folklore. You know, this is what we do. Jews uh, start saying Shana on the 5th of December. And uh, why? Well, it doesn't matter. That's just what we do. It doesn't matter. If you, you, this is what we do. Halakha doesn't have to make sense. Torah does not have to make sense. Uh, and, uh, and this is, I think, a, 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 a real tragedy. This is the, the real uh, issue here. It's not, it's much, it's much, that is the much greater issue rather than than uh, arguing about whether you should say it on this day or that day. Well, that's also an issue, but, but, but the underlying issue, which, which permeates uh, an endless number of halakhic discussions and Torah discussions, is are we doing things that the Torah and the Chachamim directed us to do based on reason and based on applying the rules and the, and the uh, principles that Chazal indicated that we should be using? Or, or have we reneged our responsibility as as conscious and cognizant human beings with a brain and who know the sources and have have have, have the intellectual ability to uh, to master those sources and understand what needs to be done there seems to be a general admittance that we just re renege out all our responsibilities and and we'll just take the easiest course, the, co the course of least resistance, which is to do what we did last year. So if last year we were in England and we said Shirat Kishamim on a certain date, now we're in, in Melbourne, we're going to do the same thing, whether it hap just happens to be uh, 25,000 kilometers away and in the opposite season, well, that doesn't matter. And once you're on that track, there's almost nothing that you, almost nothing that cannot be rationalized. You can, you can rationalize almost anything at all. You can, you can take some wire on some poles and and pretend it's a, a wall and say you can carry, because it's convenient. So if that's the easy, that's the, the path of least resistance. You, or you can say that it makes a lot of sense to wear a fur hat in the middle of uh, of a, a Middle Eastern heat wave in the summer. <laughs> Because it, somehow it can be rationalized according to this approach, or you can say, that you can claim that you can, uh, that one one poor Arab in Abu Ghosh can purchase all the hametz of all the uh, all the all of the state of Israel, and all its institutions throughout the world, uh, and that somehow makes sense because it's convenient, because it's the path of least resistance, rather than dealing with with real issues and making the Torah something that people can respect and will take seriously, the general perception, both of Irreligious and also religious people is an halakha to a large extent is a game. It's not real. It's a game. If you want to carry? Well, we can organize it. Give us some wire and a few poles, and we're in business. We can. We've solved the problem. You don't. You want. You don't want to throw. Get rid of your chametz. So well, we have a solution. We'll call up our friend Ahmed over here, and he'll he'll solve the problem for us. And uh, and you don't, we don't want to think too much about what we're supposed to do when it comes to shirat gashamim, which you wouldn't think is a big deal. It's not even. It doesn't even involve getting rid of your bottle of, of, of scotch. It's a really simple issue. But nevertheless, it seems to be too much for, for certain people to take seriously, to make Hanukha real. So let's, let's pretend we're in Bavel. So if you're in Chutzaraz, people, or throughout Chutzaraz, that's the practice today. Everywhere in Chutzaraz, they start Shalat Kishamim, 5th of December. In Eretz Yisrael, everyone begins Zion HaKeshwan. Neither of these things make sense. So the question is, do we wish to live uh, a yahadut that is some kind of a uh, some kind of a, uh, a game, some kind of a uh, show that we that we put on for ourselves and for others, and we claim that we're following these books and and we're doing the right thing, and we're from because this is what it says here, and this is what we're doing. But at the same time, we're actually anyone of anyone anyone who thinks for a moment can see through all that, see through the, the smoke screen very easily and, and, and internalize the message. The real message is that we don't really believe or take too seriously what we do. We, we do what we're used to doing, we're creatures of habit and, of, and we like uh, to do things that are convenient and not think about things too much. And that's not a very, a very uh, encouraging or very edifying uh, way for, for the Torah 
and halacha to be viewed, because the halacha is simply an expression of, of the Torah. If if that is the standard halacha, that means the Torah is that way. The Torah is understood that way, and the Torah is implemented and lived in that way, where where you don't have to be be real. It's 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 a very I think it's a, that's the the real issue here, and it's something for for everyone to think about. For those thoughts, I'll, I'll leave you and I wish you all Shana Tova and Hatima uh, Tova. Yes, um, just to kind of uh, kind of echo that point that you were making. Uh, for a, for a rather brief period, uh, I, I had been uh, well for a couple of Shabbatoth. I went to a place in America, which is uh, I had relatives that lived there, so it was a rather you'd say radical non-Orthodox community. And in there, they had a woman there who calls herself an Orthodox feminist. She said something that was extremely telling. She said, when there's a halachic will, there's a halachic way. So when you talk about the idea of how you got rid of Shemitah through a, mag- a magic halachic wand, got rid of the prohibition of keeping chametz in the house with the magic halachic wand, got rid of the <laughs> prohibition of carrying on Shabbat with the magic halachic wand. So she says, well, take your magic halachic wand, make women rabbanim, have them be called up to the Torah. Just wave your magic wand. It's Allah Akbar, it's Allah Akbar. Which I guess is the, the end game of such thinking. I think you're correct. That's true. So I'm going to ask the rabbi if there's a way uh, to force the issue with the, with the recognized gedolim uh, so that maybe we can at least have an open discussion uh, of the way halachot are reached. And... Uh, at least we can open uh, open the discussion somewhat. Once upon a time I was young and naive, and I thought that was a possibility. <laughs> You're apparently still young enough, naive enough to think that out wrong, but I, I know that's not possible. And I don't even think it's necessary. It's not necessary to uh, for us to feel that we cannot do what we believe to be and know to be correct because so-and-so doesn't yet, yet agree. So and so doesn't agree. Maybe he never will agree, and that, and that can be one so and so or a million so and sos. It doesn't make a difference. If we know and and understand clearly what it is we we should be doing and what we want to do, therefore we can just go ahead and do it. And nothing speaks louder than action. The Chinese have the, ex- have, have the expression that a picture is worth a thousand words. My version of that is one action is worth a thousand discussions. One one minyan where something is done the right way. One one person who does the right thing and doesn't is not afraid to let someone else he knows know that he does it that way. He, if you do things like a, like a Murano in, in in secret, and no one knows what you're doing, well, you may be doing the right thing, and you may feel good about that and quite justifiably so, perhaps. But but uh, you're preventing others having to deal with that fact. But if you let it be known, this is what I do. This is what uh, this is what our rabbi says, this is what the, the, these posakim say, this is what the Gemara says, this is what we do. And we don't, we don't mind if you don't happen to agree, that's okay. So don't agree, we didn't ask you to agree, we're just going to do it the way it has to be done, to the best of our knowledge, to the best of our ability. That, that I think, is the more powerful statement. And, and if, like it says in the Gemara, you know, if Hashem uh, sends a certain ruach, tahara, the, 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 the people, well, more and more people will begin to want to know why they're doing what they're doing. And, and if something doesn't make sense, they won't, they won't just somehow succeed in convincing themselves that it's okay, let's just go on and pretend we never notice that there's a problem here. If more and more people uh, hear what's true and it makes sense to them and they begin to do it, then things will begin to change. I can't say, I can't predict when that will be, I can't say how long it will take, but but what makes the difference is the is the actual doing, the action, and not the discussion. I could write, and I might write an article about this. But I, I have no, and, and maybe the article will convince a few people, or maybe a dozen people, or maybe fifty people, or a hundred people, to change what they do. I, don't, I can't say for a fact, but I know that. The, but if in such an article it states there is, there are minyanim, there are people who do this, that that 
to, to most people is, is more powerful than all the arguments and all the quotes from the Ritba or the, or the, uh, or the uh, Meiri or, or from the Talmud Yerushalmi. That's all esoteric. But they know that people are doing something, that, that, that talks, that's, that's reality. Reality talks louder than, than words. Actions speak louder than words. That's, that's my, my approach. Okay, we'll stop here. Kotov, Shalom.